What'd you say? Well, I was, of course, deeply upset, and um, I, um, I thought, well, I'll never see him again. I, I, I can't handle this. But because of Stephen and uh, because of some of the other things, um, when Jess had called me to come to Austin, I always went. When was the last time you saw President Johnson? I saw him in Houston, Texas. I had been in a real bad car wreck, and I had undergone lots of plastic surgery. And I thought that perhaps maybe I had healed well enough to see him and just called and he said he wanted to see me. And the astronauts that had landed on the, the moon, they were having a big party there in uh, Houston and we had all been invited. So when Jess told me um, to come to Houston, I, I thought, well, I was well enough that I could go. And uh, I met him at the Shamrock Hotel in Houston. The year? August of 69. Do you believe that your former paramour, Lyndon Johnson, had anything at all to do with the death of John Kennedy? No, I did not have anything. Do you believe that he had anything to do with it? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. You do? Yes. As you sit there today, you do? Yes. Did you know what he was talking about? Uh, I knew the people that he named, yes, I certainly did. H.L. Uh, Hunt was a very dear friend of mine, and three days prior to the assassination, H.L. Hunt gave me one of the um, wanted for treason pamphlets, and they just bombarded Dallas with it. And wanted for treason, JFK. Uh -huh. They thought that the liberal president was a treasonous man. Right. Selling so, the country down the river. So I said, H.L., you cannot do the president of the United States that way. And he said, well, hell, I can. I'm the richest man in the world. I can do whatever I want to. But Dallas, Texas was bombarded, and he passed them out personally. Number one, what I do in my book is I perform a criminal investigation of Lyndon Johnson. And while the Warren Commission performed a criminal investigation of Lee Harvey Oswald and determined him to be a murderer without a motive, if you take all of these other possible parties who could have killed the president and combined all their motives together, they wouldn't have as many as Lyndon Johnson himself. He had personal motives, he had economic motives, he had political motives. We start with motive. Then from there we go to opportunity. Lyndon Johnson was involved in planning the trip. After we go to opportunity and you look at the Texas Connection, which is what my book is about, everything that was involved in this assassination pre and post, Lyndon Johnson was involved in. We can go to Jack Ruby. Ask Madeline Brown how she met Jack Ruby. Did you meet Jack Ruby, Madeline? Yes. Um, Lyndon Johnson's attorney introduced me to him. Go on. I'm serious. Where? I was coming out of Neiman Marcus and happened, of course, I knew the attorney, and he was standing talking to Jack Ruby, and he says, I want you to meet um, Jack Ruby. And... Um, so, uh, I Wait still a have... second. When was this? Oh, 1952, I think. Way back. Ten yeah. years before the assassination? Oh, yeah. So, Lyndon Johnson's attorney. Which one? Uh, Jerome Ragsdale. The same guy who wrote you the letter yes. after LBJ died yes. and said that the financial arrangements mm -hmm. would be continued. He was standing with Jack Ruby, you say? Yes. Did you ever tell any of the authorities this? Yes. Who'd you tell? Uh, well, I told... Well, not the Warren Commission. They didn't talk to me. They didn't ask you no. to testify? No, I was Go told... Go on. I was told if they contacted me in any way... They should watch some talk shows, these guys. <laughs> I, I well, what'd you say, James? I said <clears throat> the Warren Commission didn't even talk to the closest witnesses to the assassination. Bill and Gail Newman, you know, they were right there. Did we all remember the pictures of them shielding their children on the grassy knoll? Warren Commission didn't even talk to them. And there were over a dozen witnesses on the overpass, every one of which was aware that the shots came from the grassy knoll from behind the stockade fence. Only one was called. And when he said that the others saw the same things that he did, they didn't call any of the others. Craig Zerbel, who picked the Warren Commission? Let me just tell you this. What these two men are saying, who are experts in the assassination, is absolutely true. The Warren Commission was a politically biased entity created by Lyndon Johnson for the sole purpose of getting him out of another political scandal. This one, of course, the worst of his career. And the reason I say that, if you look back in history, 1963, November 22nd, what happened? The Texans came out and they said it was a lone killing, a lone assassin. And if you look at law, at the, ki the killing of a president in 1963, if it was caused by a lone assassin, was only subject to state, state jurisdiction, not federal. 
And Texans came out and they said it was a lone killing. Therefore, they had exclusive jurisdiction to investigate the case Craig, and prosecute. Craig, Craig, are you indicting the whole Lone Star State in your theory? I don't have to, Geraldo, and the reason for that is, if you look at history, and no one is going to deny it on this panel, on the evening of the assassination, the truth of the matter is Lyndon Johnson called people in Dallas, including uh, the Dallas District Attorney, and told him to charge Lee Harvey Oswald with being a lone assassin, regardless of whether anything else he could prove. Do you allege that LBJ himself called together a group of co-conspirators and said to them, I want this man dead, I want him to be killed in Dallas? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that he specifically ordered a murder? Absolutely. And in fact, if you go back and look at history, in 1961, Billy Saul Estes, who was one of the people involved with the scandal involving Johnson, has testified that Johnson ordered the killing of an agricultural agent down in Texas. That was when he was vice president. Uh, an in interesting point that Robert brings up when he discusses his theory involving a uh, secret team is that uh, what you state in your book is that the way we can determine the people who are involved in a secret team is by looking at who got the best jobs afterwards, and that's on page 439 of your book. Who in the world got the best job after the assassination? Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, Geraldo, if I may interject for a moment, you said who put the Warren Commission together. The answer is Lyndon Johnson. He appointed them. He asked Earl Warren to head the President's Commission. Uh, 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 Warren said no, he didn't want to do it. He was basically drafted by Johnson and told that he had to do it. It was a matter of national security, that if the truth were known about this, that, the, that the, it could lead to World War III. The phony evidence planted against Lee Harvey Oswald that he was working for Fidel Castro, had that been made known to the public and had they believed it, Johnson would have no alternative. He would have had to invade Cuba. Had he done that and, and uh, Castro survived and asked for help from Khrushchev, Khrushchev, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, could not back down a second time. This was the excuse. This was the cover. And this is how they were brought in. Uh, you mentioned about the, uh, about the making of the commission and who, who assigned them. Lyndon Johnson had made the statement that one of those uh, Warren Commission members, uh, someone who we all know named Gerald Ford, could not chew gum and urinate at the same time. I think that's a very accurate statement, but if he honestly felt that way about Gerald Ford, why did he name him to this most important of commissions? And worse than that, President Kennedy, after the Bay of Pigs, fired Alan Dulles as director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Dulles hated Kennedy. His whole career was ruined by Kennedy, and he got to be named one of the seven Warren Commission members. He certainly had an axe to grind. I was just the other woman in his life, and uh, my emotions are still the same for him as they were when I met him as a very young girl, but I'll always love him. He was the father of my son, Stephen. That intimate relationship with Johnson continued for many years. Through him, she became familiar with the closed world of power politics in Texas. On the eve of Kennedy's assassination, she attended a party at this house in North Dallas, the family home of oil billionaire Clint Murkison Sr. There was an extraordinary guest list that night. We had H.O. Uh, Hunt, Murchison, Lyndon Johnson made an appearance. We had Hoover. We had Richard Nixon. Uh, they were the most influential people there. But I was under the impression that since Jagger Hoover was there, that it was to honor Hoover rather than anything else. When Lyndon came in, no one was expecting him. So when Lyndon arrived at Clint Murchison's, they all went into a conference room. And you could just feel the, the atmosphere. And when Lyndon came out, uh, I was, of course, happy to see him. I did not know that he was going to be there. And he whispered in my ear at that time, those blank de blank uh, Kennedys will never embarrass me again. That's no threat, that's a promise. So he departed. The party rapidly broke up after Lyndon uh, departed. I'd like the entire world to know how I personally feel is the fact Lyndon Johnson knew about the assassination and was a part of it. Yes. Hey, Edgar Hoover on 2192. 
Are you familiar with this uh, proposed group that they're trying to put together on this study of your report? No, I haven't heard of that. I, I, I've, I've seen the uh, reports on this on the Senate investigating committee that they've been talking about. I want to get by just uh, with your file and your report. It would be very, very bad to have a rash of investigations. Well, the only way we can stop them is probably uh, to appoint a high-level one to evaluate your report. Yeah. And put somebody that's uh, pretty good on it from uh, that I could select and tell the House and Senate uh, not to go ahead with the investigation. Yeah. There's a photograph that I published in Texas in the morning, and the White House uh, photographer told, you can see that Lyndon lost a composure at the time. Uh, Bobby hits a post and he has something in his hand and Lyndon is real shocked and the uh, photographer said that Kennedy, uh, Robert Kennedy said to him, why did you have my brother killed? Our president was as, as a gentleman and a human being. This man is a not. Yeah. He's mean, bitter, a vicious animal in many ways. I think he's got this other side of him and his relationship with human beings, which make it very difficult unless you want to kiss his behind all the time. He's able to eat people up. But I understand that, you know, he sends all kinds of reports over to you to, about me and about the Department of Justice. Not any that I've seen. Well, well, I just understand that, that uh, he's about to be planning and plotting things. But he hadn't, he hadn't sent me any report on you or on the department, any time. Well, I had understood that he had, that he had, had uh, sent reports over about me. No, no. The overthrow of the government by force and violence. No, no. Leading no. to no, that's a, that's a, that's an error. He never has said that or indicated or given any, any uh, indication of it. As I say, we'll all get through. Okay. Yeah. I'll talk to you on day or two. Fine. Bye. With Kennedy out of the way, the dark forces behind the curtains were able to continue in all the evil plots in store for the agenda of the New World Order. Nearly all of the things Kennedy fought so hard against flourished with a vengeance which still lasts to this present day, nearly 50 years later. It is now clear that the plot to dethrone the Kennedy brothers was all too real, and the Federal Reserve still dominates the planet financially, wars still rage in all corners of the earth, and the CIA continues to murder people all over the world. If you ask yourself who actually in this world harbors weapons of mass destruction, it becomes quite clear that it is the same group of people claiming to want to put an end to terrorism that is causing it. If Kennedy were to be alive today, our world would be a very different place. The picture should be clear that the shadow government, with the assistance from the CIA, ensured this cursed future. The covert skill and ability to plan and stage a coup enabled the CIA and FBI to take control of the United States, maintaining public enslavement. For half a century, they have eluded from releasing the fact that our own government could murder one of its own leaders and just like a real-life George Orwell story, deceive us into believing and basing life from falsifications, which have yet gone unpunished. If an average citizen were to conspire to commit murder, their life would be minimized to a confined area with a cement slab bed. Why then can our government murder and continue to get away with it? The answer is simple. Every single one of us is afraid. Yet most of us know that together as a whole, nothing would stop us from gaining our freedoms back, bringing life back to where it should be. We the people. Dallas was to become forever linked with the murder of the president. But the rich and powerful men who had met in secret the night before had everything to gain from his death. LBJ was fearful of a long prison sentence, J. Edgar Hoover of losing his job, and the oil men of losing millions of dollars. When the shots rang out on Elm Street the next day, those problems were solved. It is quite evident that the shots that killed the president came from the grassy knoll area. It is also quite evident that the ones responsible have done everything in their power to cover it up, and with such imminent CIA and FBI involvement, it would seem one would have to have the intelligence of a flea to actually believe that Oswald had fired the shots from the Texas School Book Depository. In 1994, a confession was given by a man who claimed to be the killer of John F. Kennedy. 
After attempting to kill 30-year-old police officer David Ostertag, James Earl Files was arrested and sentenced to 30 years in prison. What'd you say? Well, I was, of course, deeply upset, and um, I, um, I thought, well, I'll never see him again. I, I, I can't handle this. But because of Stephen and uh, because of some of the other things, um, when Jess had called me to come to Austin, I always went. Uh, I knew the people that he named, yes, I certainly did. H.L. Uh, Hunt was a very dear friend of mine, and three days prior to the assassination, H.L. Hunt gave me one of the um, Wanted for Treason pamphlets, and they just bombarded Dallas with it. When was the last time you saw President Johnson? I saw him in Houston, Texas. I had been in a real bad car wreck, and I had undergone lots of plastic surgery. And I thought that perhaps maybe I had healed well enough to see him and just called and he said he wanted to see me. And the astronauts that had landed on the, the moon. Do you believe that your former paramour, Lyndon Johnson, had anything at all to do with the death of John Kennedy? No, I did not have anything. Do you believe that he had anything to do with it? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. You do? Yes. As you sit there today, you do? Yes. Did you know what he was talking about? And they were having a big party there in uh, Houston, and we had all been invited. So when Jess told me um, to come to Houston, I, I thought, well, I was well enough that I could go. And uh, I met him at the Shamrock Hotel in Houston. The year? August of 69.